For $5 a month, you can actually see the Thin Green Line interviews and other video content on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and feel like you're part of the conversation. Join us. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Thin Green Line podcast. Um, We want to thank our listeners and our viewers uh, today, especially because you guys have really made this podcast popular and we haven't even been up a year yet on the Thin Green Line. Um, But you've been with us through Warden's Watch for a couple of years now. And between the two podcasts, it's it's been going fantastic and we couldn't do it without your support. Uh, We just want to ask you, if if you have a minute, get on Apple and do a five-star rating. Um, If you're liking the podcast so we can network it a little bit more. Uh, conservation is a big issue, as you guys know, and all the uh, really dynamic and fun guests we've had uh, appreciated as well. So with that being said, we have a very special guest today. Uh, We're going to be talking to Barry Kirch, the iconic drummer of the uh, multi-platinum rock band Shinedown, who, unknown to many of you guys, is quite the conservationist and outdoor enthusiast and lover of all things outdoors. So we share a lot of uh, uh, passions in the same area. And uh, Barry, how are you doing this morning? Good morning. I'm doing very well. Yourself? Dude, we're great. It's so cool to have you on the show. And uh, I know you and I have had the opportunity to meet and talk through other podcasts and and, and really connect on a lot of levels, both musically and, and especially on the outdoors. And uh, so we've got a lot of questions, but I kind of want to start with you as a drummer. Um, sure. You know, we both love music. We're, I'm, I'm part of a, a rock band up here to a far less scale than what you guys <laughs> are doing on the uh, professional <laughs> side of Shinedown. It's and I uh, love Hey, man, it's all cool. You know, we share that. And I love your music. I'm a fan myself. And a lot of our listeners and viewers have been following Shinedown. And you guys have been rocking hard and touring for, man, two decades. You've been with the band almost 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. It started uh, here where I live now in in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, It's hard to say, but yeah, 20 years ago. Mm. Um, (laughs) That's hard for us to say too, uh, Barry. (laughs) Yeah, right? (laughs) It's amazing how quickly that time flies until you look in the mirror and see all the great. Mm. Um, but yeah, 20 years and, uh, still going strong, still enjoying what we do, which is most important. Um, you know, obviously everybody's had a tough uh, year or so, um, we're not touring and things of that nature with the the pandemic, but we're still making music and we're working on whatever our next record is. So it's a, it's a labor of love and a passion and I still enjoy it. I'm sitting here in my home studio as we speak. So. Yeah, I see some cool equipment back there. It's always good to see the home studio going. Uh, we, we got a little yeah. bit of the same going on this side. But, you know, the cool thing is you guys are one of these bands um, and some of the biggest rock bands that I'm fans of, you know, Shinedown included and, and Rush and all these these bands have just stuck together as friends, as teammates, as brothers. And they've been so you know, effective and so successful because they keep that relationship and that team spirit going first. You know, they don't, they don't have these meltdowns and the egos and, and, and all of that. And you guys just seem so balanced in, in what I'm getting to know from you guys. And uh, it's the same thing we see in conservation. You know, you're talking to a couple of game wardens that both have 30 year careers retired. You know, Wayne was a supervisor in New Hampshire, working squads and teams that, you know, at life or death situations relying on each other. You know, my background with the tactical unit with Matt, Um, you're the same type, you know, and now that, uh, you know, being out of special operations from a law enforcement standpoint, being in a band myself, I have that same relationship with my bandmates up here. And it's kind of like a new tactical unit, you know, you really got to rely on each other and, uh, and all of that. And I mean, you guys are, you've done six studio albums. If I, if I'm, um, getting that Correct. correct and over 10 million record sales and, and you guys have been on a worldwide tour. And I know when I was introduced to you, you guys were just coming off the, uh, I think, the European tour for the newest album, Attention, Attention, mm-hmm. and just getting ready to start here in America. And I was this close to getting to go hang out with you guys. And then the <laughs> pandemic dropped, man. So uh, we'll, we'll, let's hope this ends so we can finally do that. But right. now, now that you've been through this whole process, let's go back to the very beginning. When did you start drumming? And what, who are your mentors, your influences in the rock and roll world to, to catalyze all that? Sure. I, I started pretty young. I was seven years old. Um, wow. <laughs> I was thankful, but I, yeah, I, I have a very supportive family, both my mother and at the time, my, my grandmother and grandparents, uh, my grandmother, her brother was a, a jazz drummer, no, nobody famous. And I didn't actually ever meet him, but she said I was reminded her of him. And so for my seventh birthday, I, you know, instead of the pots and pans that I was ruining, I finally got my first snare drum 
mm. and uh, was able to get <laughs> started from there and, and kept playing. And I, I was lucky enough that I played in the school system, but I also had some really good teachers uh, early on um, that were able to guide me and, and introduce me to a wide range of music that I probably wouldn't have been introduced to. And I have an older brother who's a huge music fan and actually a, a, a professional radio DJ and has been for uh, a long time now. Nice. <laughs> I've been out there for a long time now. Um, but uh, so he was always introducing me to music, you know, 80s metal and things of that nature. So I, I, music was a thing in my life. I think early on, my drumming influences ranged from, uh, you know, it was a lot of 80s metal stuff. So it would have been Iron Maiden, Nico McBrain. And he was a big one for me because you know, everybody in that time period had the big drum sets with the big double bass and right. we couldn't afford that. And we couldn't afford double <laughs> yeah. bass, you know? And Nico was the one guy that played with a single bass drum of that period. And I was like, that's my guy. Um, <laughs> and I liked their music and their album covers were really cool, you know, with the, the iconic Eddie and those things. So, oh yeah, he was a big one. Uh, and then, you know, it branched from there into, you know, Def Leppard and what was popular at the time, but then into Stuart Copeland of the police. And, and uh, then I fell in love with, R&B and especially James Brown and James Brown's drummers because of nice. just how funky that was. Um, and then I had the teachers throwing me into the jazz world and 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 uh, those areas. Louis Belson, like the classic big band, even up and through the the more modern Chick Korea type of jazz. So pretty varied early on. You know, my passion mm-hmm. is always rock and roll, and that's playing a rock and roll band. But I was very lucky to be introduced to a lot of it and to work on that and be taught some of those things. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't hold a jazz band together save my life these days because that's not something i work on as right. much anymore but uh i still enjoy it and i still listen to it and there's still a ton to learn i still take lessons to this day actually that's super cool and you know it's <clears throat> you hit it it's so rare to hear rock and roll drummers saying that they had any background in like jazz or sure. symphonic or, or any of that stuff you know and, and to have it at such an early age the diversity of that that that's super super cool so how did that morph into getting to the professional level and uh, where were you before shine down and, and what happened when you met Brent and the guys and, and all of that good mm-hmm. stuff? Well, you know, I, I played through school and I played uh, in the marching bands and all that. I was drum major my senior year of high school and uh, all those <laughs> things. Uh, and that got me a scholarship to the university of central Florida down in Orlando. Nice. And so I went there and was in the music program for my first two years in the marching band um, and kind of fell out of love with the, scholastic side of the of music because the the program there though very good was grooming you to be a teacher i didn't want to be a teacher i wanted to be a rock drummer right and so i moved on from that ended up getting my degree in anthropology and i had i was going to do forensic anthropology and in doing that i had very little bit of chemistry and took that chemistry to get a basic (laughs) uh basic biology job up here in Jacksonville, Florida, I was working for a company called Lake Doctors. And our job was to uh, spray for feral weeds in the water system, uh, all the retention ponds and lakes and stuff around this area, spray for feral weeds without killing the wildlife. And so I got, it was a great job. You know, I'm up Mm. at four in the morning in the lakes, finding all the best fishing spots. (laughs) Um, And it was cool and seeing gators and seeing the water moccasins get scared to death by them. Uh, cause they're little territorial suckers. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I was doing that and my brother being in radio said, Hey man, there's this guy, Brent Smith, he's here writing to writing stuff and working in the studio. Um, he signed to Atlantic. He's looking to build a band. He's holding auditions for a drummer. And, uh, he said, I think you'll really like his voice. And I got a demo of Brent Smith's project. Oh, geez. And, uh, <laughs> listened to it and went, yeah, I love his voice. Went and auditioned, and it was at the time our original guitar player and bass player, Brad and Jason, were already in the band, so they were looking for a drummer. And my audition was two songs that were on the first record, Lacerated and 45, which 45 ended up becoming one of our more popular tracks. Right. And uh, so I go in and play, and they said, okay, good. You played those well. Why don't we want to see how you do in a studio? So the next day, I pack up my drums. I go to the studio, or not the next day, but within that week go into the local studio that they were working out of um, that no longer exists. But um, I go in there and I set up my ratty broken drums and cymbals because they weren't exactly <laughs> studio ready at the time. Um, and we recorded 45 and they're like, great, you can record in a studio. You didn't get red light fever. You're in the band. Wow. All of a sudden quick. <laughs> yeah. Like a month on. later, we're in a month later. We're in LA recording. And what's funny about that whole time period 
is we go to LA and we record the record and we did some of it in Atlanta as well. Um, but we did another version of 45 that was big and grandiose with strings and everything else. And once the record was done and we're listening to it with our a r and our label guys, they're like, you know what? That original version of 45 just had a vibe to it. So the one you hear on the radio and the one you hear on the record is actually my audition piece. Really? Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's with like, all those broken little, symbols and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> there's a little shine down trivia that people will be excited to hear. That's good to know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and then from then on, it's, it's you know, we've had our ups and downs. And obviously the, the, the two original players aren't here anymore. I mean, they're alive, but they're not in the band anymore. Um, and like you said, teams, sometimes they break down and you got to reform. Yeah. And that mm. happened. And it was the, you know, it was a different time. Um, I still talk to those guys. I'm actually giving the our original guitar players son drum lessons as we speak but uh nice um it just didn't work out and you had to re- we had to regroup and now uh eric and zach that are in the band and have been in the band longer than the original two were in the band you know it's one of those things it's just a better fit and it works better and we've actually grown more because of that mm. yeah no that that that's super cool and you can definitely see that in the newer albums and uh mm-hmm. you know we've been you know from a cover standpoint we've been playing with some of your stuff we cover a lot of classic rock stuff but you're amazing singer brent oh my gosh you know yeah. <laughs> that is one of the best highest most balanced singers i've ever known in the rock world and being the highest singer we're, we're working on some stuff second chance is one of those that i can do some of his other stuff i can't but you guys have some fantastic new songs and, and the classics and love that stuff on attention especially real cool thank you yeah no he's a he's really an impressive guy and it's a it's a gift from god because he's not trained as a singer he just started singing um yeah. he didn't grow up in a music family his his he grew up in a very southern baptist style family you're not going to listen to that and they would throw out his cds and stuff like that um but his dad gave him a notice reading uh i believe it was a cassette at the time and he would listen to that over and over and fell in love with that voice and that's how he learned to sing was singing to Otis reading mm. of all things that's crazy um, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, just the passion of your band comes out and everything you guys do from the early stuff all the way to the latest stuff. And he just sustains it. It's, it's incredible. So, yeah, he's, he's very honest in his music, which is cool. You know, he can't write fairy tales. You know, he doesn't pull right. it from they're all they're all life experiences. Everything you hear from us is real. So that's what I think makes it special and why the fans continue to connect to it. Yeah, no, it, it definitely comes across. And on that note, what are what are some of your favorite songs that you like to perform live? Um, when you guys get back on the road, both, um, you know, from Shinedown stuff, but you guys do a heck of a lot of cool covers too. Um, yeah. I actually, I actually discovered you guys through covers way back when you covered simple man. And that sure. song was dedicated to me kind of between like my mom and my relationship and the whole career journey and everything. And, um, honestly, your guys version, how Brent sings that is the most moving from the original. Um, so your covers are incredible, but what do you like to play, man? What, I mean, everything's cool, but do you have some favorites? Yeah, I think uh, for me, when you're playing and watching the crowd in front of you, and you know this from watching the crowd, when you see their reactions, that's what gets you into the song. Oh, you yeah. Because I've played all these songs a million times at this point. So for me, it's not as much fun. You know, I don't sit in my room and go, I'm going to play Shinedown songs. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unless we're in rehearsal. Right. <laughs> but uh, when, you're, when you're doing a show, the song's like enemies or sound of madness that you can see the crowd start to do this thing yeah. and they're starting to swell and you see the fist in the air. Those are the songs for me. And then sometimes, like the second chances or the ballads, um, when Brent gets the lighters up in the air and here you are in front of a crowd of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, and you see a sea of lighters, I mean, it still gives me chills to this day to to see that. That's what makes it special. So it's it's the crowd reaction to certain songs that really gets me going. Yeah, no, I, I I share that 100%. And it's it's sometimes some very weird songs. They're not necessarily the most yeah. popular songs, a, a B-side thing. And and for me, you know, being um, singing most of the songs for our band, it's it's usually some of those slower ballads that I end up doing. It's strange, you know, and, and our, we like to stay harder like you guys do. But when we do that, the crowd loves it. And we got to have that in our repertoire, uh, like like you guys do. And I, so that's when the connection of the audience is the most powerful. And it's usually later in the set, late at night. And it's just, just amazing. Um, yeah, a lot of times you come to find out, you know, like you, Simple Man was a, a thing in your life and your career. Um, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, hey, that song was played at my graduation. Yes. Or at, or at a funeral, you know, yeah. or 
we got married to that song or that was my <laughs> mother mother son dance at my wedding and i'm like are you kidding me you yeah, know yeah, those yeah. things are and that's i think when you play those ballads um connection and even you know it, it, there's a connection there you know I, I, it's funny how many of the younger generation comes up and says hey we love your song simple man i'm like whoa 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 that's not yeah, our wait, song well, that's <laughs> <a good guy. laughs> it's hollow ground we don't mess with that you know are <laughs> like we're the we're the fourth band to cover it, but thank you. Yeah, uh, but thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, Barry, I got to ask you, you know, being a drummer, you know, we lost kind of an iconic drummer last January, Neil per Peart of Rush. Um, yeah. How did, how did that, I mean, it, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but no matter where you are as a Rush fan or not, they were very sure. influential, you know, growing up for me and, you know, big fan of them and you guys and many other eighties rock bands, especially, but um your thoughts on that? Um, wh wh how did that resonate with you as a drummer? You know, and knowing it was, was right. It was it was weird because to say I'm not, I'm not a a Rush fan is is wrong. I'm a fan of Rush, but I wasn't the diehard fan of Rush. Yeah. Um, and Neil was a huge influence, but it wasn't. I he wasn't my first go to as my favorite drummer. You know, everybody says my favorite drummer is Neil Peart. He wasn't that, but was he a huge influence? Yeah, he was iconic, and uh, he created pretty much prog rock drumming or at least put it on the forefront you know there's king crimson and other drummers that were there at the, before at the same time but it was him that everybody said that's that um and it really hit me hard it really did and i didn't think it would you know i was sad and i know guys that know him and i know a lot of drummer friends of mine um that have either worked with them toured with them or or you know people in the industry and you know i just sat here and it was one of those that i went damn not him. One, he's too young. Right. He kept it hidden so well. And he had such a hard life leading up to that. Yeah, he had all the successes with Rush, but his personal life was really hard and it was finally put back together. And then he was gone. And that it was it was hard to see. It really was. But you know what? <clears throat> no matter how early you go out or whatever, he left a legacy. And that's pretty cool. Not a lot of people get to do that. And if you get to leave something behind that people remember forever, you know, Rush will always be talked about and neil pert will always be a household name that's pretty amazing to me yeah no ab absolutely and the thing about it was it was so moving for him and you know I, I see this a lot you know when you as a conservationist and your love for the outdoors and family um not your typical you know rock and roll stereotype drummer and the thing was sure. with you know, with his riding and you know his adventuring and his motorcycling and his hiking and skiing i mean the spirit of the wild was in him so deeply like it is in yeah. you and me and wayne and your bandmates uh you know and and that's what really tore me up um and, and the losses you know losing his wife and his daughter within a year years ago and the band going on a hiatus and and bouncing back from that you know i'm like you guys they always had a message of striving and motivation and adversity and getting through adversity and it usually resorted to coming back to that inner circle team and i i i see that analogy between what alex getty and neil were as a band and a team growing up since high school and then you guys in shinedown you know yeah. and there's just so few bands that do that so and being a drummer and of your quality i i just i've never got to ask you that before so it's an honor to kind of share that um and we still feel the sting of losing neil um, we cover one rush song, you know, in our band in area 56 and we're, the guys are gracious enough to be doing some more with me since I am one of the you know, biggest rush fans in the band. But, um, yeah, the whole, the few jams we did, the gigs we had that I've shared with you that we could do through COVID we tributed, you know, new world man to Neil and everybody in the audience resonates with that, whether they were 70 years old or 15, you know, they yeah. just kind of knew that, that legacy. So yeah, I've been, been wanting to ask you that. And uh, I, I figured, um, you were hit as hard as we were, and I'm sure your bandmates were too. So yeah, there's certain ones that that go, and it, especially when it's a surprise, and when they're as young as they are, you know, they were still <clears throat> playing. You know, it wasn't like he he was 80 something years old. And you're like, oh, that's a loss, but you know, he had a great life. You know, yeah. when when knock on wood, Willie passes. I'm a huge Willie Nelson fan. When he passes, it'll be like, man, he had a good one. You know, yeah. it's yeah, sad, but <laughs> yeah, oh, he had a good one. You know. Uh, but you get guys like that or the, uh, you know, Chris Cornell or something like that when it's just too young and, and it's just sad. It is early sixties just doesn't. Yeah. That was, that was, that was quick and hard. Um, so COVID we talked about this on another podcast together and, and, and being locked down and not being able to see the band and not touring what's next for you guys. And I know the lockdowns, I mean, things are still opening up kind of slowly on, mm -hmm. on the grander scale for a professional group like you guys. What's next? How are you guys holding up? Well, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. 
Um, thank goodness that I was able to have this time with my family, yeah. which is the best. You know, this is the longest I've been home in 20 years with my family. Yeah, was hell yeah right? <laughs> um, and that's been great, you know, reconnecting with my wife and getting to hang with my daughter and, and going, taking them on multiple camping trips and, and going in the outdoors and being able to, I was home for a full hunting season. That's rare. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's been cool and spending time with my, my, my parents, um, who live here and fishing with my father. Um, that's been great when it comes to the band, it's been horrific. You know, I miss my guys. I miss the shows. I miss traveling all of those things. Um, the good news is during this time we've been writing, nice. we have a record coming. Uh, we have plans for that in, in probably at least a song coming out this year. And then the record next year would be the ide- ideal. Awesome. And with touring, I think we'll, we'll get to tour this year. It's very difficult, and I think it's going to be a state by state choice. Uh, California, probably not. You know, they have a different lockdown system. New York City, probably not. Um, Midwest, yeah. Texas, probably going to happen. Yeah. You know, it, you come out to depends. the Northwest. You come out toward Montana toward us, man. We'll be there. Exactly. The yeah. States will have you any day, man. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. The Dakotas and Montana, it'll be like, all right, come on out and play. Um, so I, I think this fall, we had spring stuff um and it, it, those are still a possibility but it's still really hard with the rollout of the you know vaccine and those things so i think this fall we'll get a solid uh a u.s dates down festivals and things um when it comes to international who knows that's a crapshoot i think everybody's gonna have to have a card or something saying i got the shot before we can go over there um which really bums me out because i really enjoy touring over there um but as long as we get to play again, I'm, I'm ready to go. I've been ready to go. I'm, I'm like, here's both arms. Can I get both at the same time? Let's go. Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's to hoping you guys get back on a, at least a little Thanks. bit, you know, mid year or something. And, and we'll get to see you for the rest of the attention, attention and, and the new stuff that, that we didn't get to yeah. see last year. Um, yeah, it was a bummer getting cut off and we were going to do that acoustic run where we were playing all the deep tracks and, we enjoyed doing that at the end of a touring cycle. You know, that attention and tension was waning. It was time to move on to what's going to be the next record. Right. Um, and we tried to end a tour and we did on Sound of Madness and Amaryllis where we can go and do smaller venues, but it's for the fans and they get to call out, you know, I want to hear what a shame, which we never play, but it's a good song. And we'd play all those deep cuts and maybe play a few more covers and have a good time. Those shows are a lot of fun and, and, mind-numbing at the same time because i gotta remember how to play those damn songs but uh, <laughs> Go back in the way back machine. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna play what tonight okay we better sound check really hard on that song um <laughs> so those tours are fun and it's a bummer that we didn't get to do that but yeah we'll get back out there i think it, it's got to get back to somewhat normal eventually mm. yeah we're looking forward to it man we're pulling for you guys yeah. big time thanks I'm sitting back here as a consumer, not as a host, because I'm listening to you guys go back and forth. And uh, yeah, this is the podcast I want to listen to because uh, I'm enjoying you guys going back and forth with your professionalism. And you know, I think this is what the Thin Green Line is all about: is bringing people that support conservation, conservation law, into so other people that support us can understand that the, the deep connections we have. And that's kind of you know, I do a lot of research, Barry, when I'm not real familiar with our guests, so I listen to a lot of your interviews and. Stuff stuff and i'm excited to bring out this outdoor side of you uh yes. because i don't think that's yeah. been brought out a lot and you know the, the the passion that that wild edge that you and john spoke about that's in both of you john went one way you went another and he kind of played in the music as well but uh that wild side of you that outside that conservationist that that guy that you know hunts sure. and fishes and, and really connects to nature like you said that first job you know you you were watching all those little things that were going on and <laughs> yeah you had a deep connection there and i'd really like to, to peel back that onion and talk about yeah you know that side of you and does that and, and, and does that influence your music at all i mean that outdoor connection that wild side uh i think maybe a little bit but not intentionally okay you know, because I think the wild side, especially being a drummer, is in you when you play drums. That wild, you know, that abandon that you just let loose. And, and it's a grouse freedom. drumming in and, the morning. And, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and, or that damn squirrel that's got your number and uh, <laughs> you away. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's primal. Drums are primal. Mm. You know, it's, it's one of the original instruments. You voice and then we started hitting things. 
So mm-hmm. I think it, it really is in you. And, and yeah, when you get out in nature, you feel that primal instinct as well. And, you know, I grew up for the, my father's retired military and we moved around when I was very small, but we ended up settling in uh, Panama city, Florida, because we were stationed at Tyndall air force base. And we lived on East Bay, uh, overlooking the Tyndall Air Force Base. So, I, you know, you could see the planes coming in, but I was right there on the water. Mm. So I grew up snorkeling and fishing my whole life in that, in that water from when nice. I was nice, six, seven years old on. Um, hunting came later. Hunting came in my 30s uh, through my brother um, because my father never hunted. It just wasn't a thing in our household. Mm-hmm. It was always fishing. And uh, my brother started getting, my brother's a very outdoorsy person as well and taught me a lot growing up. Um, he started getting into it and he's like, man, I think you'd really enjoy this. Why don't you come with me one time? And I was hooked. I loved it. And the thing I loved more than anything, I, I don't trophy hunt. It's not my thing. Um, mm-hmm. If I get a trophy, that's great. Uh, I'm a food in the freezer kind of person is my mentality. Nice. Um, but uh, sitting in the morning and watching the sunrise and hearing the world come alive, mm. it's magical. And it's getting away from the noise of what I do on an everyday basis. You know, I spend my life in a venue with noise from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed. <laughs> right. So to get away from that and to take a breath of fresh air that doesn't smell like a locker room is pretty nice. Mm. It's really nice. And, and that's probably one of my favorite things about it. And then the camaraderie of, you know, you get done with the day and whether you're successful or not in the hunt, you're all around a campfire telling stories and being idiots. Um but it brings that that back and it, it puts these things away, you know, mm. those, those don't exist out there. And I, I love it. So um, it, it was in me early. I love to fish and I love, I've grown to love hunting and I've always loved the outdoors, whether it's camping with my family or camping myself or just being there. Um, it's a thing. It really is. And it's, it's magical to see. I've been lucky enough with the touring to not, you know, I haven't hunted across the country or, or in the world, but I've seen state parks and I've been able to go out in nature and, and hike right. through, you know, Custard State Park and things of that nature. And it's like, whoa, this is completely foreign to me. I grew right. up in Florida. This is beautiful as well. And it's neat to see it. And a lot of people don't take the time to appreciate that. They're used to the, the hustle and bustle of the big city life and they don't realize how many beautiful places there are in the world and especially in this country. Yeah, not too far from their homes either if they just get out there and, and, and yeah. experience it. So can, can you share one of those stories that you do around the campfire with our listeners, one of your favorite hunting experiences? Um, just uh, that's something you'd share with you, you, those guys after the hunt. and sure. Yeah, I just bring it personal. Sure. I, I, <laughs> uh, it's a story from a couple of years ago. Um, I got to go out, and where, where I hunt, we have a lease in Mariana, Florida area. So this is a, it's right on the border of Alabama. So Panhandle of Florida, border of Alabama. Nice. So you have deer, it's a swampland. So you have your gators and snakes and things that want to kill you, bobcats. And we know there's a uh, uh, wild boar there. There's hogs there, but we never see them. You just hear them because they're way out in the swamps. Uh-huh. So we had set up earlier in the year and I had a, a gravity feeder and I had a tree stand um, down at the edge of the swamp line. And it was probably a 30, 40 minute hike in from camp, maybe 30 minutes hike in from camp to get to my little spot. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go. We got in, I'm going. It's, uh, and, uh, I've got, it's still warm out. So I've got basic camo on. And then I put on a, a net ghillie suit kind of thing because I figured, okay, this will keep me hidden as much as possible as I'm getting in. And it's <laughs> right. still, still lightweight, you know? Mm. And, uh, um, I'm crawling in and I get to where I'm a few football fields from where I'm supposed to be. So I'm taking the, you know, a few steps and pause and a few steps and pausing and I'm coming down to the middle of the, the road we had cut. And, uh, I hear, a, I look down there at the, where the kind of the gravity feeder was and I'm trying to make, not ramble and make a long story short. Um, I see, I'm like, what is that? Is that bears? We, there's bears up here, but not in this area. This area doesn't have <laughs> bears for some reason. That's it. No, there's ba- those are hogs and they're just, <laughs> covering down there. there's a whole sounder of hogs and i'm like wow that's cool i'm gonna get down there and i guess we're gonna have a, a hog for dinner great um and then i hear and i went ah. and to my right right there in the wood line is a giant old male boar 
staring at me. Oh, man. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to die. It's bow season. If I hit this thing with the bow, it's going to laugh at me because um, it's so close. It's just going to ricochet off the damn thing. <laughs> um, I happen to have my pistol on me, but it's a small caliber 380. I'm like, it's just going to make him mad. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, what do I do? And it doesn't know what I am because I'm in a ghillie suit. So it's just going, what the hell are you? <laughs> And then, so I slowly kind of stand up and I back away and I'm trying to get behind a tree because I'm like, at least I can maybe climb a tree before this thing kills me. Um, <laughs> and it charges me. <gasps> and I'm like, that's it. And I scream like a little girl. Um, <laughs> and, I'm, ah! and it veers towards me and then it just takes off to the, the group. Oh, wow. <laughs> I almost wet myself and luckily didn't get killed. And it was a great day. And I was able to go back later that night for the night hunt. And I got a nice sow for dinner. So it ended up being a winner. Wow. That, oh, that, that's you, a you, great you story. Had, <laughs> you had the, uh, the <laughs> iconic boar charging scenario, man. We get a lot. Uh, of I got so lucky. California, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you made it out of that one. A lot of guys don't, you know, no, they get I, the tusks I, and I, up in the pelvic area and they're hurting. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big, he was a big silverback too. I mean, I was kneeling kind of on the ground. I was squat, squatted down watching the, the sounder. So, and he was taller than me. So he was a, he was a large, wow. large boar, oh, but man. luckily I got lucky. <laughs> Thank goodness. I think it was your scream that distracted him. Do you have one of those, uh, hunting, tri- <laughs> do you have one of those hunting trips that you want to do, you know, on the bucket list? Like, you know, geez, I want to go to New Zealand and, you know, hike those peaks and get a red stag or any of those on the, the bucket list. All of them. All yeah. Of them. Again, I'm so I'm so new to hunting. You know, I've been hunting for a little over ten years that it's all fascinating to me. And you know, you watch these guys like uh, Steve Rennell, and they're going on all these crazy uh, adventures. I'd really like to get up into y'all's neck of the woods. You know, up in the, the yeah. Montana, Dakota, Idaho, and and get you know go hunting a, an elk. Wow. You know, I've only mm. seen an elk strapped to the front of some guy's car when we stopped at a truck stop you know i've never seen one alive in yeah. person how great would that be yeah um or or you know when i did hike through custom state park with my father seeing the antelope up there how great would that be um i think those adventures just to hunt the u.s in a different area would be great for yeah. me um but i wouldn't turn down going somewhere overseas either <laughs> you know <laughs> Well, uh, Barry, we, we've talked about it, man. And when the time works out, we will, we'll get you into the Northwest yeah. of Montana, especially I've, I've got some amazing stuff to show you. Um, and I, I want to learn because I only know, you know, down South style hunting and it's a very different animal. You guys are taking extremely long shots. It's a different, you're hiking and it's a total different way of hunting that I'd love to learn. Whereas in the South, you know, everything wants to kill you in a different way, but yeah. it's very tight. <laughs> the, the brush yeah. is tight and you're not, <laughs> You're not moving around as much. Much more personal. (laughs) (laughs) You end up doing a lot of, you don't do a lot of, you can do walk and stock and some people do and are really good at it, but you don't do as much because palmetto bushes and everything is making noise. So you end up doing a lot more tree stand and sitting Mm. or ground blind and sitting hunting. Um, So it'd be neat to do one of those long hikes up a mountain and getting a, you know, a, a sheep or something. That'd be, it'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's kind of, it's, it's really cool what you're doing down in Florida. Cause in what we've shared, it's a lot like black deer hunting in California, where I originally mm-hmm. came from, you know, there's smaller subspecies of mule deer and you were seeing some of the bigger white tail we have up here, you know, in Montana, but I'm, my background was where you're at, you know, it's just the, the non-humid version of Florida and it's yeah. so smaller deer. And this year, uh, you know, I want to congratulate you because you harvested a pretty darn good sized buck for the size of the deer you have out there doing the tree stand thing and uh and having that solitude you know and cu- uh, cutting that phone off that's so so critical but um that is that is the beauty of it of other parts of the country is you can go from long range wide vistas and then get in real tight and it's it's fun to to mix it up and i know uh i know up here our hunting seasons are a little colder than you're used to but... <laughs> that's gonna be hard on me <laughs> <laughs> but early season brother and then the spring okay. season for like black bear and stuff we yeah um I'm a California guy going from hot like you are in Florida, then down to, well, I won't even tell you how cold it is this week up here because it's cold. Yeah. We're in our I won't world. tell you how warm it is here this week. <laughs> 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 so let's just say I don't have to put on long sleeves right now. 
<laughs> nice, nice, nice. Do you have Love a it. favorite berry that you hunt with, whether it's bow, gun, calibers? Have you picked a favorite yet? Uh, you... Yeah, I, I have a favorite gun. I do bow hunt, but I haven't been successful yet. Um, and I'm I'm a pretty good shot up to about 30 yards, but I'm not confident to take anything over that, mm-hmm. uh, um, which is still a great shot. I mean, most, most of your bow oh, shots yeah. are under that, typically. Uh, but I haven't been successful, and I, I hunt with a – it's a bow tech, nothing fancy. Um, I love bow techs. But my rifle, I used to uh, – I used to hunt with a, a Rossi 30-30 lever action. Mm-hmm. Nice. I love, you know, it just made me feel like a cowboy. It felt good in my hands. Um, and unfortunately, one of those horrible accidents, it fell out of the tree stand and, and snapped um, f- quite a few years ago. And so I, I was in the market for a new rifle and ended up getting a, a Tika T3 caliber in 308. And that is the most accurate, fun machine I've ever had. And it's very pretty. Um, and I use a Vortex Optics on it. And that's my go-to. I, I absolutely love that that rifle. Hey, I got I got to ask you about that rifle because um we we've talked about that a little bit and it is a beautiful rifle after seeing pictures of it. But it, is it, I got to ask you, is it a drummer thing with the three hundred eight? Because our drummer Josh runs a three hundred eight model seventy Winchester with the same Vortec optic you have. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. <laughs> so so I was telling him about your rifle. He goes, he goes, Barry shoots a three hundred eight. <laughs> well, he's, he's cool beyond being just a drummer then, you know, uh, la, 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 yeah, la. I, go, yeah. I go, the ironic part is he's got your same damn scope, Josh. And I helped Josh sight that thing in and bore sight and get him on the long range with it. And it was just ironic when you set that over and I go, okay, maybe there's a trend here. I'd like to know. The other drive right. rock and roll world that hunt with a 308 and run vortex optics or any combination thereof, man, small world. I, I don't know what happened because everybody else pretty much in, in my, my hunt camp, my brother and, and his best friend, they all are 30 out six or 20 out six. A 30 out six is probably the most common in this area yeah. of, of a hunting rifle and, and one of the most commons across the board. But yeah, that one just spoke to me and it was because it had that beautiful wood stock. I, I like classic looking things, you know, I, I have a few, you know, I, I have, modular guns and things of that nature but they don't speak to me as much as just a classic looking uh gun or rifle that that says something to me and and vortex i actually got turned on to them by uh, a man named reuben who actually works for vortex and took me on a tour of their facility up in uh, wisconsin and took me around and i got to see what they do and he turned me on uh, i never forget he gave me one of their uh, uh mill spec scopes and I, I looked at through it the wrong way because i'd never seen a scope built that way you know it's got the yeah. really short yeah. end i was like and he's just laughing at me i'm like okay i don't know that much about the style of <laughs> scope i'm used to the plastic <laughs> <laughs> um but that's what turned me on to vortex was going through there and seeing what they do and, and here in their history you know they started as a retired the owner was retired military started as a binocular bird watching company and then they branched into uh rifle scopes and things that later on so it was kind of neat to hear their history and that's how i got into the vortex brand yeah they're a great company and they make great optics um yeah we're we're using them a lot out here and uh it's and that and the 308 what a great caliber i mean that's something you could do almost anything in the entire country and Mm. you know we have a lot of 308 shooters up here with the right bullet it'll do elk it's good for bear it's good for smaller stuff great for whitetail and it doesn't kick the heck out of you you know like if you're ever going to put your kid on it or your wife's going to shoot or, or any of those, I, and it, I mean, it's that sniper military caliber we carried on duty for, you know, carbines as well as our sniper rifles and 308s just, I mean, iconic and a uh, lot of options there. It's super cool to see that working for you. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoy it. And, and for me, I'm not a, I'm not a large individual. I'm a pretty tiny guy. So anything that really kicks the hell out of me, I'm not a fan of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need I to stay in my watch. shoulders. I got to play. Neither am I. <laughs> so bear, um, staying a, a little bit on that topic, but you've got, you shared with us your second passion to drumming close second, and it has to do with something we all enjoy. Can you, you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, on, on sure. the cooking element, the, the, Man, I, that, 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 that is that. definitely my second passion. I love to cook. Mm. I love to cook. Um, that happened out of necessity. You know, I grew up, I grew up in the leave it to beaver family. I will say I had a really good family. Uh, you know, my mother was there for me. It was the stay at home mom. Dad was military. He was always there for us. So I, I'm very blessed and lucky. And I, and I, and I know that, and I'm very appreciative of it. Um, but we always had home cooked meals. There was always a meal on the table. You better be home for dinner and you're going to mm. sit at the dinner table. That's <laughs> what it was. 
And, you know, lo and behold, I'm out of the nest at 17 going to college and I'm eating this horrible cafeteria food. And I'm like, I can't, <laughs> I can't do this. I just can't do it. Um, and at that time, you know, it was early nineties. Uh, Emerald was the big thing on the food mm-hmm. networks. You know, that was just starting. And I started following him because I love Creole and Cajun food. And, and that was his specialty. And I just started cooking because it was cheaper than eating out and it tasted better. And I fell in love with it and I've been doing it ever since. So, you know, from 17 to being in my mid forties now, I've been cooking and I cook all the time. Um, and it's funny because my wife can't cook. So I cook for Perfect. the house. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I leave, if I, if I go for the weekend to go on a hunting trip or whatever, my daughter says, who's 10, she goes, we're going to starve because, you know, mom doesn't cook. You're making uh, mom I, feed us. No. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so when I leave for the road, I actually, I, I will uh, do a cook day or a couple days and I will cook massive amounts of meals, prepackage them, freeze them, or I, I have a freeze dryer nice. so I can freeze dry. Some of those preppers, I like to have food, survival food. Um, so I will prep everything for them. So all the wife has to do is go to the freezer, grab the meal they're good to go, you know, or maybe nice. they decide that. Um, but I love it. I, I, I explore all different kinds of food. Um, you know, yeah, my first love being Creole Southern style food, but I've gotten and branched out into Thai food and even Japanese food, which is just foreign to me. So I'm going to learn those techniques and, yeah. uh, and I've got a shelves of, of, uh, cookbooks and, and stuff like that. And I've been studying a lot of uh, Jacques Pepin and his methods, very French, um, culinary techniques so and i even thought about and i was going to this time off going to culinary school just to fill in some of those gaps um, of my knowledge for the fun of it but obviously with COVID, it it didn't happen um and maybe i will at some point because i just truly enjoy it i find it fascinating and it's something we all have to do we you have to eat so why not eat good food yeah absolutely well there there's there's a making us hungry man we want to try some very first (laughs) cuisine I will happily cook for you. When we get together, I will happily cook. And sometimes, you know, depending on the show day, if you guys come out to a show, uh, my guitar player, Zach, he's a Memphis guy, loves barbecue, loves to grill. We actually have a grill on the road with us. And if we're going into a day off, a lot of times he and I will prep during the day, throw some stuff on. And after show, we'll have some pork butts or ribs done. And we divvy them up and put them in all the all the buses, all the opening bands, crew buses, everybody else. We just give everybody a rack of ribs to, to say thanks. And we get to cook. So it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's, that's super cool, man. That's a treat. Uh, and that was going to be my other question on that is, do you end up being that guy that cooks for the band when you guys are either maybe recording, traveling, touring, and, and, and that kind of thing? Cause I would think they just love that. What a treat to have somebody like you in the band that loves to cook and make such good food. Um, especially when you're doing road food, right. And right. it's not centered in having the meals you like to have on a steady basis. I have, especially, uh, during the recording process. I'll, I'll, if we have take a day off, which is very rare, uh, we're all workaholics. So when we get into studio mode, it's, we're there every day, all day, 15 hours. But right. when we do take those days, um, I love to cook for the guys and have done that and they enjoy it. You know, I'll say, Hey, what's your favorite meal and thing of that nature and, and, and make something really cool and special for them. Um, on the road, not as much one, you don't have the setup, you know, right. the bus doesn't really have a kitchen, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. you can do, you can get a hot plate and make stuff and you can make it happen, but there's not really a dedicated kitchen on the tour bus. Um, we're lucky enough now where we've gotten to the level when we're on a major U S you know, when we're headlining a tour here in the U S we can have catering with us. So we carry our own catering nice. and the, the morale change for that is, epic not only for the band but for our crew they know that they're going to get a good hot meal mm. in the morning they're going to so have a great lunch. there's yeah. something available it makes a huge and then difference yeah yeah it makes a huge difference then okay we just showed up at the state fair and they forgot we were going to be here there's no breakfast for our crew and they got to get started it's horrible uh, you know it's, it's just demoralizing the rest of the day is just a crap shoot um or the food's just not that good which you've it happens, you know, their catering's not that good or, Oh, we thought you guys wanted hot dogs again. We don't, we'd like a nice meal. Um, <laughs> doesn't have to be, you know, a four star Michelin meal, but it's, we'd like a nice meal to feed our guys. Um, and what's nice about carrying your own catering is you can also 
create, help create the menus or at least give them guidelines. Hey, this is what we like. This is what we don't like. We have a few vegetarians on the crew or some gluten-free people. Here's what we need. You know, we want a soup every day for that's sitting out there so people can quickly snack. We want a good salad bar. Um, you know, I can, for the bands, we can kind of control because we eat pretty healthy on the road and we, we work out a lot. So we're like, okay, we want a lot of greens. We want good lean meats, right. that kind of thing. So, and I can help design the menu and you can also go to them and go, Hey man, really feeling like we want meatloaf today. We just want to home <laughs> down meatloaf and, <laughs> and it can happen. You know, those Love things that. are good. You know, yeah, it's not to say we don't have our cheat days. We do, you know, there's been times every time we go to Knoxville, Tennessee, where Brent, our singers from, he grew up going to this, this crystals, which is like a white castle. Um, you know, those really nasty, small slider burgers um, that are so delicious. And this particular crystal crystal he loves. And when we're there, don't think after show, we're not on the bus with sacks full of these crystal burgers. Oh, you guys are burning out, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, oh God, we just <laughs> eat so many of those things. The next morning, everybody's running off the bus to find the closest bathroom. It's it's a horrible <laughs> <laughs> oh man man no that that's great it's great you guys have that opportunity to keep that cuisine kind of decent you know because it, it gets to not only morale right but it gets to when you're touring and you're rocking every day and you're traveling that is physically and mentally taxing to no level and i don't think people outside of music really understand they see the glamour of rock and roll but they don't realize when you're doing a two three four hour show or mixing it up night after night and especially you as a drummer putting out the most mm. exertion it's a workout. It's a cardio. Yeah. It's a, it's a, you know, a, a, a anaerobic workout and you're wrecked. You know, we're wrecked after every three, four hour show when we gig and we're starving and sweating and, you know, having to rehydrate and, and you guys are doing it on such a constant basis on the, prof- you know, the highly professional level. Um, that food content is so critical for that. And that's, that's another element people don't realize um, when you're eating junk and, and trying to stay healthy as a rock band and be successful, it, it leads to your success by, by having yeah. that good diet, right? Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, you don't realize, and even I didn't realize early on how much it takes out of you, you know, cause <clears throat> when you're headlining a show, we've got lighting pyro going off fire on stage and you're right. trying to give it at all and entertain a stadium full of people. Mm. Um, it's a lot of work, you know, <laughs> and you, if you yeah. don't eat good, you feel it. You really yeah. do. Um, and, the older you get, especially you do. And we're in a rock and roll band. You want to stay as young as possible, as long as possible. That's kind of the, the double-edged sword. You, you want to appear young, even as you get older. And that, that requires you to take really good care of yourself. There's a, there's a woman out of a Canada who came out to a few shows and she was doing research on um, uh, drummers and how much they exert during a show. Mm -hmm. And she uh, came out a couple of times and measured, my exertion during show and she put on like a heart rate monitor and these bands on my arms to, to right. get all the vitals and stuff tilt <laughs> play the show and it was so cool because she could uh register how much you exerted in per each song and which songs were the most aggressive during the set which were the least interesting those kinds of things. yeah and you could see it all but at the course of the whole thing i found out that i burned about a thousand to eleven hundred calories per show wow which is insane <laughs> yeah um uh, yeah. so you better eat good, yeah. better hydrate because I'm doing that five nights a week. Yeah. The good news about that is I can eat whatever the hell I want when I'm on tour and drink beer and be okay and never get huge. So <laughs> that's, yeah. the, no doubt. Yeah, that's the bonus. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. The same feeling when I'm training for a hunt or do an athletic event or a triathlon, I can eat like a mm-hmm. pig. I can eat pleasure food. Uh, I can balance it out. You're right. But then you yeah. go back to everyday life and at our age, man, with the metabolism slowing down, mm. Yeah, keeping the weight off. So it's, it's no joke, but yeah, I would have, yeah, I've got, I've got a COVID five pounds that I've had to work off, you know, it it (laughs) happened. Um, but I still, I still work out really hard when I'm home because it it feels better and I don't want to lose that. You know, you you always, that first week of getting back to rehearsals and then playing those first few shows, it's just, you can't replicate that until you do it. And it hurts for that first week. It is for everywhere. Yeah, yeah re- mm. rebuilding all that muscle memory and, and just that that tax on your body and that schedule. And, and you, you have to do it really to get back to it. There's no other way to train for it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then also for my other guys who I'm not a singer, but for them, they have to get that lung capacity back up because all yeah. three of them are singing. And Brent's not a, you know, a lot of those rock singers, you'd be surprised at how quiet they sing. 
Yeah. Brent is polar opposite. His voice right. is loud. His lungs yeah. are massive. I mean, even when he talks, we, we make fun of him because if he starts talking, you know, if I'm on the phone, on the bus, in the front lounge, and he comes out <laughs> and starts talking, uh, honey, I got to let you go. I can't hear you. You know, it's just, just he takes over the room. He takes over the whole room and doesn't even realize that that's his normal speaking voice. Yeah. Uh, hey, man, that's great. That's what makes him so epic, man. Have to yeah. rain back on vocals, you know? Yeah. There's um, no rain in that kid back. There never has been. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for part one with Barry Kirch. Stay tuned for part two in two weeks when we open up with nomadic outdoor cooking over open flames. Talk to you soon, and thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm.